Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My presentation today will deal with the issue of nutrition economics and the complex links between foods, incomes, and health. And let me begin by saying how privileged I am and how honored I am to be following on this podium my very distinguished colleague, Professor Walter Willett. As you will see, our presentations will be exactly complementary. We differ somewhat in our approaches. Let me tell you how. Nutritional epidemiology tries to link diets and chronic disease. The focus is on macronutrients, micronutrients, dietary ingredients, or even specific foods. Hence, you hear stories about soda and diabetes, trans fats and adverse health outcomes, fruits and vegetables and better health. In each case, a nutrient, an ingredient, an antioxidant is linked to a health outcome, adjusting for inconvenient covariates such as income. Now, social scientists take a very different view. They say it is impossible, or at least very hard, to separate the person from the food they eat. And it is very difficult to separate the foods from the food supply and therefore culture. So waiting to take their place alongside nutrition epidemiology in the study of diets and health are sociology, economics, and behavior. So the emphasis here is not so much on what is on the plate, the emphasis is on what is around the plate. And around the plate are social factors, socioeconomic factors, social class, and incomes. So my presentation today will deal with the economics of nutritional choice, and I will take similar approaches to delineate the problem. First of all, yes, there is a global health crisis. One of the reasons we have the problem that we do is that the global diet has become very rich in calories and it is becoming relatively poor in nutrients. And that is the global problem of hidden hunger. This was referred to earlier this morning. It is a major phenomenon even in wealthy industrialized societies. Our people are getting too many calories and not enough nutrients. So that malnutrition, different forms of malnutrition, can occur even in high-income societies. And I think there is an economic cost to that, and there is an economic reason. One reason is that the empty calories cost less, and some, not all, some nutrient-rich foods cost more. So healthy eating for many people is becoming too expensive, it is becoming too stressful, and it is really, so to speak, not on the menu. So, the theme of this meeting is cultural revolution in nutrition. So I say, the story of sociology and economics and nutrition economics is now coming to the table. So let the cultural revolution begin. And there is a story here as well. Within each group of society, there are people who seem to be able to get a healthy diet at low cost. We have become very interested in those people. We call this an example of nutrition resilience. Resilience is the capacity to withstand stress. So the question we have is, can resilient people eat better for less? First of all, who are those people? What is their behavior? What are their attitudes? What do they think? And what foods do they buy? And in the United States, one group characterized by nutrition resilience are actually Mexican Americans. And we think that ethnic eating habits have much to do with getting healthy diets at low cost. So this idea of nutrition resilience, hold that in mind. We'll come to back to that later. And also, I want to share a personal experience. Every time I come to a different country, Turkey included, 
I go to supermarkets, I go to farmers markets, and I take food prices into account. So these are some photographs I took last year in a department store in Yokohama, Japan. Fruit are not a traditional part of the Japanese diet. The beautifully packed fruit that you see are really gifts. They are not for everyday consumption. But if you look in pr at prices in yen, you can see that each beautifully packed bunch of grapes is close to 4,000 yen, and that is $40. That would be 100 Turkish lira for a bunch of grapes. And so contrast Japanese prices with prices in a fruit market in Ankara, where I was two years ago, and again I went to a farmer's market and looked at prices, and the beautiful tomatoes, and the prices are much less than they are in Japan. So nutrition economics has absolutely everything with the type of diet that you have, the quality of the foods that you buy, and the health outcomes. And this idea is certainly not new to me. It has a long and involved and distinguished history, I should say, because the first book linking food, health, and incomes was written by Professor Sir John Boyd Orr in the United Kingdom in 1936. What he was finding in 1936 was that a large part of the British public was too poor to afford a healthy diet. So John Boyd Orr wrote a signal report on food health and income. He later became the first director general of the Food and Agriculture Organizations of the United Nations and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1949 for his nutrition research. So as you see, linking food health and incomes has a long and distinguished history. Now what Professor Sir John Boyd Orr was able to show was a socioeconomic gradient in the consumption of different types of foods. What he was doing for the very first time was to stratify the population by income. That was at the time very novel and open to criticism. Now, not everyone does it. We do, but in most cases in the United States, nutritional data are broken out by race, ethnicity, gender, and age, and never by social class. One reason is that officially in the United States, social class does not exist, so you cannot study what does not exist. So the social gradients that you see here are that the consumption of fruit, the consumption of vegetables, and the consumption of fish rose with incomes, exactly as it does in the United States of today. That absolutely has not changed in 80 years. We still have the same social gradient in the consumption of vegetables, fruit, and fish. So you may wonder whether or not the benefits of fresh fruit have to do with antioxidants, or are they more to do with the fact that people who consume them are rich and have health insurance and are thinner and healthier. And again, going back to England of 1936, you see that bread and potatoes and lard and sugar had no socioeconomic gradient. And in fact, now in the United States, sugar has become what's called an inferior good, meaning that sugar and regular sugared soft drinks are primarily consumed by the poor. So you have gradients going this way and that way and it is impossible in studies of nutritional epidemiology to account for it all. And those gradients have not really shifted in the past 80 years. We see the same thing in France and elsewhere. There is a major issue of cost when it comes to the selection of healthy diets. And the question, why can't the poor eat better, was also asked in 1936 in the United Kingdom. The person who asked it was no less than George Orwell, the famous British writer responsible for such books as 1984. In The Road to Wigan Pier, George Orwell was commenting on a letter written to this new statesman by someone who was very middle class, who said, for three sh four shillings a week, 
I can have a diet which has whole grain, fresh fruit, and dried fruit. And the question was, why can't the poor do the same instead of spending their money on tea and white bread and jam and a whole lot of sugar? Just like the diet of the poor of today. George Orwell's comment, which still holds, is that low-income people don't eat that way. They want something satisfying. They want something tasty. They want something good. A millionaire, said George Orwell, can live on brown bread and raw carrots, but a working-class person will not. What they really want, they want more sugar and they want more fat, and of course, that is what we have today, and that is the problem that we face. Interestingly enough, the current dietary guidelines for Americans is advising us to eat more plant foods. As you see on this slide, every single food on this slide is a plant food, not an animal product inside. These are all plant foods. So what are the reasons? And my colleague Barbara Rolls will deal with some of the motivations and trying to get children to consume more vegetables and fruit. Why don't the poor eat like this? This picture is actually from a brochure produced by the United States Department of Agriculture. This was a suggested dinner for a low-income family benefiting from food assistance. So take a look at this plate. This was a nutritious plate for food assistance recipients, a satisfying dinner. First of all, first question is, how many calories on the plate? Now, you, some of you are probably nutrition experts, you're expert in this, but I'll give the answer to you. The number of calories on this plate is 300 calories. 300 calories is not a lot of calories for dinner. The second question I have is, what did it cost to buy? Because mushrooms, red peppers, Brussels sprouts, green beans, you have to buy those in large amounts. So I actually went to a store and bought those foods. It was around $10 for 300 calories. Again, remember, that the food assistance in the United States is $42 per person per week. This took 45 minutes to prepare. This was not a balanced meal, and was consumed of, composed of foods which are not eaten that often. When you look at the frequency of consumption of various foods in the United States, French fries will win out over Brussels sprouts any time. The second problem that sometimes we have with the dietary guidelines is that some of those foods that are being portrayed are aspirational. This is not the reality for most people. Yellow peppers cost $3.99 per pound. Fresh tomatoes, fresh salmon, very expensive. Cherry tomatoes, again, this is the cover of the dietary guidelines for Americans, and the reality is that food assistance benefits are $42 per person per week. On the right, you see another brochure which talks about behavioral economics and diet quality of nutrition assistance program participants. Notice, if you will, the peeled kiwi and the peeled oranges, and I suppose you can live well on nutrition assistance, provided you have domestic help. And so this is the issue. Sometimes the issue of cost is more perceived than real, and sometimes it is real. And the question is, if by paying a bit more for the food that we eat, will we realize nutrition benefits? And the answer is, of course we will. And then, as I will tell you later on, nutrition resilience may have a lot to do with cooking at home. So staying at home and cooking a meal, an important part of culture, this is where culture comes in, may in fact be the way to have a high quality diet at low cost. And then, occasionally, you see pictures of celebrities who undertake a week's diet for $29. I will not mention the celebrity, but you can Google this on the web. 
this was a food bank challenge, challenging people to eat all their meals for a week for the total cost of $29. So this is the market basket of one person. As a nutrition scientist, I went and calculated the calories, the nutrients, and the cost, and noticed that here you have a very nice, very nutritious, plant-based diet, high nutrient density, but what you have here is under 900 calories per day, which is clearly inadequate for any adult person. So you can have nutrients, you can have calories, but this diet is not adequate to live on. In fact, a better choice for the amount of money, not to be hungry, probably would have been more fat and more sugar and more starches, because at least that prevents you from being hungry. So let's now move on to some underlying scientific concepts which are behind all this reasoning. The first very important concept, which my colleague Barbara Rolls will talk about later on, is the energy density of foods. And knowing about energy density is absolutely fundamental. The second concept is nutrient density of foods. So when energy density of foods is calories per gram, nutrient density is nutrients per calorie. And then affordability, a key concept of my presentation, is either calories per unit cost or nutrients per unit cost. What are you getting for your money in terms of calories and in terms of the key nutrients? So just a few things. What I have plotted on this slide is energy density in calories per 100 grams on a horizontal axis and water content on a vertical axis because water content and energy density of foods are actually inversely linked. Vegetables and fruit have volume and are heavily hydrated. Fats and oils and dry grains and nuts and seeds have no water and their energy density is high. So energy dense foods are dry predominantly. But dry foods are cheaper per 100 calories. In fact, I always say that the most expensive ingredient in any food is water. Because water means cold chain, storage, perishability. Low cost foods are going to be fats and oils and sugars and grains. And this is the way it is. So energy dense foods can promote overeating but they're also very cheap, which means overeating does not cost you extra. And then the problem that we have is some cheaper foods, not all, some cheaper foods can be tasty, but nutrient poor. I say some because there are some energy dense foods which are not expensive, and those will be nuts and beans and some grains, they are energy dense, nutrient dense, and inexpensive. The problem sometimes is people don't like them. So now you have this complication of nutrient density, energy density, cost, and palatability, all of which have to be taken into account. So what we have been doing is establishing nutrient profiles of food. So we have been rating foods based on their nutrition content. And the nutrient profiling has taken off, and nutrient profiling is now being used by different groups. On one hand, regulators want to use it to regulate marketing and advertising. On the other hand, industry has been using nutrient profiles to improve the quality of the food portfolio. So some companies are using nutrient profiling schemes to reformulate foods to take out the added sugar, to take out the fat, reduce the salt, and see if the nutritional profile of the food improves. And you can use those kind of techniques to profile individual foods, you can use them to profile menus or meals, and you can use them to profile total diets. So very briefly, I'll show you that we have created such a score it's called the Nutrient Rich Foods Index. It's available on the web because it's in public domain. It's free for anyone to use. We looked at nutrients to encourage, 
protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. We looked at nutrients to limit, saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium. We calculated an algorithm, and then we started rating foods based on their nutritional value plotted against energy density. So this is how things come out. So on the horizontal axis, now you see nutrient density of different foods. Notice that no, not all fruit and not all vegetables are equal. Some are better than others. One of George Orwell's books, Animal Farm, is about equality, how some animals were more equal than others, and some vegetables are more equal than others. So here you have vegetables and salad greens to the right, you have dried fruit and french fries towards the left because of the fat, and then the energy density, of course, goes up. And then you have grains going all the way from fortified cereals on the right to cake and cookies on the left. You have dairy products where the nutrient content goes left to right depending on the saturated fat. And then you have nuts and beans and eggs and meat and fish. Note the high energy density of nuts, but relatively good nutrient content. Then you have the fats, and then you have sweets and soft drinks and sugar. And when you add everything together, it looks like this. And notice that this is a continuum. I never say good foods to the right, bad foods to the left. It all depends. It's an absolute continuum, and there are foods of differing nutritional value within every food group. So nothing is inherently good, nothing is inherently bad. It all depends, and when you start looking at the total dietary pattern, everything changes because then you start looking at the nutrient quality of the total diet. One problem is, of course, as I was saying before, that some nutrient-rich foods can cost more per thousand calories. So if you want to fill up as cheaply as possible without caring about nutrition, and you don't care about the nutrients, just the calories, you know where to go. It's going to be the foods to the left. The foods to the right, which are much more nutrient-rich, are also going to be associated with higher cost. But as I said, not always and not for everybody. What is this nutrition resilience and who are the people who are making the right decisions? How can you have foods which are both nutrient rich and lower cost? Can this be done? And so here what we have been doing is looking at following dietary guidelines and looking at the cost of following dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines for Americans suggest that we eat more of whole grains and vegetables and fruit and milk and so on, and more fiber and potassium and vitamin D, and less saturated fats, refined grains, added sugars, and sodium. And every five years, the United States Department of Agriculture comes back with a diet quality index. It's called Healthy Eating Index. And this is a measure of compliance with dietary guidelines. Now, the index is not perfect. The Harvard Index is viewed by some as an improvement. Uh, the Healthy Eating Index does the best job it can in measuring compliance with dietary guidelines, which in themselves can be problematic. But be it as it may, what we have been doing is looking at the cost of the higher scores of the Healthy Eating Index. So in a very unique study, what we were able to do is to attach national food prices for 6,000 foods obtained from the US government with dietary intake data from the National Nutrition and Health Examination Survey. And we were able to calculate the cost of the Healthy Eating Index for tens of thousands of people. So these are now healthy eating index scores by diet cost. These are the components of the healthy eating index from the bottom up. Total vegetables, greens and beans, total fruit, whole fruit as distinguished from fruit juice, 
whole grains, dairy, and so on. And the five bars represent progressively more expensive diets. And clearly, as the diet get more, gets more expensive, the diet is also high quality, which means the more expensive diets to the right in the top quintile of cost have more vegetables, more greens, more total fruit, more whole fruit, and less added sugar and added fat at the top. The higher scores mean better compliance. And we get very similar data for women, we get very similar data for men. In every case, the healthy eating index cost is associated with higher diet quality. The two seem to be completely tied for the population. And our question was, what if we were to identify a group of people for whom diet quality goes up and the cost does not? So here we started focusing on meals at home and the time spent cooking. So one of the studies already published by my colleague Pablo Monsivais, who's now at Cambridge, we found that time spent cooking and preparing food was actually linked to higher quality diets and more vegetables and more fruit. And then, in the most recent analysis, we found that the frequency of cooking meals at home was linked to higher diet quality scores without a corresponding increase in cost. So here we now have data from the Seattle Obesity Study showing an increase in diet quality, but this time on a horizontal axis, you see the frequency of eating at home. So people who were eating and cooking at home more frequently had higher quality diets and they were not paying anymore because there was no corresponding increase in diet cost. So this is where culture comes in. Because cooking and eating together at home is a part of social bond. My French sociologist colleagues tell me that eating is a personal act that is performed in public. By eating with others, we share. By eating with others, we control what we eat. A lot of the overeating that we see is people eating alone in front of the television set. So in fact, the French have a word called commensality, commensalité, which doesn't quite exist in English. It means coming together to the table to share. And this is where the sociology of nutrition makes a very important contribution, in my mind, as important as the contribution of nutrition epidemiology the behaviors and the social bonds and the choice behaviors all come together to give us healthy diets at lower than expected cost. So I say, let the cultural revolution begin. And the cultural revolution in nutrition is a theme I set alongside nutrition transition, on which I have also published with my colleague Barry Popkin. The nutrition transition is the shift from the traditional grain-based diets to a dietary pattern with more animal foods and more added sugar and more added fat. And the problem here is that the empty cost, the, cost of, the low cost of empty calories makes them very attractive to the world's poor. And this is why we have hidden hunger. Too many calories, not enough nutrients. And yet, such things as cooking at home, making good choices, making good affordable choices, helping people to identify healthy, affordable foods, we can bring about this cultural revolution. And interestingly enough, the word cultural revolution has some connotations of the class struggle. So the challenge before us in this revolution that we're embarking on today is to make sure that healthy, foods are affordable and equally available to all. Thank you.